Ruby Gems. They make it easier than ever to add features into your Rails application, but that can also cause headaches down the road. How do you decide between using a gem or writing it from scratch? And if you do go with gems, how do you decide which gem to use when there are many available which seem to accomplish a similar task? Well, this episode is going to be a little bit different as I give you some tips on exploring gems and finding the one that is a good fit. One of the first places I turn to in doing research is the Ruby Toolbox. I love that projects are broken down into categories, which is a great way to solve a situation. So for example, if I need to add authentication to my app, there's a category for that. And it gives me a nice overview of different projects which are available for accomplishing this and a rough idea of their popularity. Now at this point, it's a good idea to narrow down your application's requirements. In this case of authentication, you need to ask yourself, do I want to authenticate through Twitter and Facebook or handle authentication through a password? And if so, do I want the ability to reset a password or do I care what the authentication looks like? All of these are great questions and can help decide which gem to use because they each handle authentication in their own unique way. Now, another important factor in deciding is seeing how active the project is. Uh, the Ruby Toolbox gives you some idea here, but I usually like to check out the GitHub project directly to have a more accurate depiction. So let me focus on Devise for a minute. It's one of the most popular Rails-related gems. And uh, here you can see the last commit was a couple days ago, which was very frequent. And if we look out the full commit list, uh, it is just a very active project. If there were only a few commits over the past year or so, then I'd be a little concerned because it might not work with the current Rails version or it might break on the next Rails major release. Another thing I like to check out is the issue tracker. If you compare the number of open issues to closed issues here, you can get an idea on how responsive they are. And seeing over 2,000 closed issues here, I'm really impressed with the contributors to Devise. It's a lot of work to manage a popular open source project, and they're doing a great job. Next, I like to search for the project on rubygems.org and compare when the different versions were released. Uh, the most recent release was uh, several months ago, which could just mean that it was a really solid and stable release, but that is something to be aware of that it is a ways behind the uh, Git repository. Now, while I'm here, I also like to check out the runtime dependencies. It's important to understand that you're often not just adding one gem to your application. Even the dependencies can have dependencies. In the end, you might be adding in a half a dozen gems, and these are all moving parts that could break compatibility in an update. Uh, oftentimes, when I run into an issue with a gem where it doesn't seem to behave like I expect it to, it's with some kind of odd dependency issue. This is why the gemfile.log file in your Rails app is so critical. It locks all the versions down for gem dependencies, so even if there is a new version available, it'll stick with the older version until you run the bundle update command. So when you do run that command, just watch out for odd issues because there might be incompatibilities. Also, when you're adding a gem to your gem file, you might want to use this greater than tilde operator as demonstrated here, so that way, if there is a major update uh, and you run the bundle update command, it will only update this last digit, and that way uh, it likely won't break a backwards compatibility. Next, I want to talk about documentation, which is sadly lacking in many Ruby gems, but sometimes something is well documented, it's just that I'm not looking in the right place. One thing to always check out is the project's wiki. Uh, there can be a gold mine of information here, and that's easy to miss. And also, not all pages might be linked within the wiki, so check out the pages section for a full list. You should also check out the rdocs, which you can often find at rubydoc.info and just search for the GitHub project there. So this provides a nice way to browse a documentation that's within the actual source code. You can often find all kinds of goodies in here, and even if there is an extensive documentation, you can find a good overview of the different classes and methods that the gem includes. Now, another great way to learn about a project is to dive into the source code itself. This is something I like to do for any gem I add to my application. Not only will it give you a better understanding of that gem, but you might learn some cool tricks too. While I sometimes just browse the source on GitHub, for some serious spelunking, I like to clone the Git repository so I can browse it locally. I like to have a special GitHub directory set up where I can just clone projects into for exploring. So let's explore Devise. Now one way to estimate the size of a project is to do a line count. I like to use the clock command, which if you're on a Mac with Homebrew, you can install with brew install clock. So I'll run this on the app and lib directories for Devise. So this contains about 3,000 lines of Ruby code, which I think is quite a lot. It's definitely one of the larger authentication libraries, and this is one of my main hesitations when considering Devise. 
but I also have to take into account that it packs in a lot of features. This is where it's important to understand what your requirements of your application are. If you want a more lightweight and simpler approach to authentication, consider writing it from scratch like I show in episode 250. That's only about 100 lines of code. Anyway, this shouldn't be your only deciding factor of using a gem, but it is certainly something to be aware of. Another thing I like to check while we're here is the number of lines in the test or spec directory. Uh, this just gives me a rough idea on how well the project is covered because I like a Ruby gem I use to be well tested. And uh, this has nearly 6,000 lines of code, which is definitely a lot for considering the project size. Next, let's briefly dive into the source code of this gem. A good place to start is under the lib directory, under the file that matches the same name as the gem. This is often the one that's first loaded in. This will often tell us what dependencies it uses and sort of give us an overview of uh, the structure of the gem. And uh, don't forget to go down to the bottom where it might require some more files. A good next stop from here is the uh, rail tie file if the gem has one, or in this case, it's just called rails. So let's check that out and right here. So this will give us an idea of what happens when it loads this gem into a Rails application. This is a full-on engine, hence the uh, app directory, because it's going to uh, load in other files there for models and controllers and so on. And also notice that it's loading in some middleware for Warden. And it looks like this includes some helper methods here and adds in some OmniAuth support, adding in middleware for that if it's configured. And then a few other things that aren't quite as important but getting to know what's happening here can really help debugging situations where things seem to go a little haywire. Now, if the gem is an engine like this one, be certain to check out the app directory because there are a lot of things that you'll need to probably know pretty well inside of here because you might need to override certain behavior and it just helps to understand what uh, the gem is actually providing in your Rails app. Now, I won't be diving into this here, but it's usually pretty easy to walk through because it's basically a Rails app within a gem. Well, that's all I have for you on this topic. I hope it gives you some ideas when you're needing to uh, add a feature into your Rails app and considering various gems on picking the right one or considering writing it from scratch if you don't want the extra dependencies. Thanks for watching. Here I have an example blog which contains a list of articles, and I would like to add tagging to this application so each article can have tags assigned to it. Now surprisingly, I haven't covered tags much in the past, but let's remedy that. Here I'll show you two different techniques, uh, one using a gem, and another way to implement tags from scratch. Now there are a lot of tagging libraries available to choose from. Uh, by far the most popular is Axe as Taggable On. Uh, while it is a little bit dated, it's one of the few that have been maintained through the years. So this is what I'll be covering here in this episode. To add this to a Rails application, just go to the gem file and add the Axe as Taggable On gem there, and run the bundle command to install it. Next, you need to run a generator provided by the gem called acts as taggable on migration and note the underscores here instead of dashes, which are used in the gem name. And then I'll migrate the database. And notice this created two tables for us, tags and taggings, and you don't have to make the models for these because they're included in the gem. Now with that set up, we can get started in adding tags to this application. What I want is when I edit an article, for there to be a field which will allow me to insert tags for this article. To do this, I'll go into the article model and add in a call to acts as taggable, which is what the gem provides, and I'm also going to add in an attribute to mass assignment here called a tag list, which is an attribute that is provided when we make that call. Next, I'll go into the form partial template and add in a new field into our article form for editing that tag list attribute. And I also want to make this label more descriptive, so I'll call it tags and then separated by commas because that's the format it expects. Now let's try this out. Reloading this page and I have this tags field and let me insert a couple uh, tags here and then update this article and then edit the article again, and there are the tags, so it looks like it worked. Now, if you want some cool auto-completion behavior when editing the tags, check out episode 102, but I won't be covering that here. Instead, what I want to do is on the articles list page here, I want to display the tags for each of the articles underneath the content. So here's that index template where I'm looping through the articles, and underneath the content, I want 
a paragraph tag here that says tags and let's just display the articles a tag list. Now reloading the page and there are the tags for that article. Now I would like to make these links though so that when I click on one it filters the articles to just those that contain that tag. As it turns out, the tag list attribute provided by the gem is actually going to return an array with strings inside of it. However, when you set this tag list, you set it with a single string separated by commas. So that difference is a little bit strange, but it's just how their API works. So since this is actually an array, we can turn this into links by just mapping this. And for each of the tags, we can just call link to and then pass in the tag. And we don't really have any routes set up for tags, but let's make one called tag path and then I'll pass in that tag string. And then I'll join all these links together with a comma space. So inside of the routes file, I could make a full tags resource with a tags controller and a show action to respond to this. But for here, to keep things simple, I'll just make a single route uh, called uh, tags and then taking a tag argument. And let's just map this to the articles index action. So we'll just go to the articles list page and let's say as tags. So that way it uh, uses that same named route. Now reloading this page and well, it doesn't quite work because it's escaping our HTML. To solve this, I can pass this whole thing off into a call to raw before outputting it, which won't escape the HTML. And whenever you're using this method though, that's usually a good sign that you're doing something a little bit complicated for the view layer and you maybe want to move this off into a helper method or something. I won't be doing that here, but it's just something to keep in mind you'll probably want to do. Now reloading the page again, and there we go. We have links here and they go to the proper path, except this uh, should filter out the list of articles. We can do that easily enough. Inside of the articles controller index action, I'll just use a quick if else statement to check the tag parameter. And if it exists, then we want to fetch the articles in a different way than just fetching all of them. And the gem provides a method called tagged with, and I could just pass in the tag string into there and it will do all the logic for us. With that change, when I reload this page for this given tag, it shows only that article matching that tag. All right, so our tag list is working now, but what if I want a quick way to browse all of the tags? A common way is through a tag cloud where I just have a set of tags up at the top and there are different sizes based on how popular they are. So let's add this. Near the top of the index template, I'll add a div with the ID of tag cloud. And I can use a helper method that the gem provides to do this called tag cloud. And this accepts two arguments. The first one should be a set of tags that you want to display inside of here. And an easy way to get this is article.tag counts. And counts is because it needs to have a count assigned to each tag on how frequently it appears. And also, I, the second argument here should be an array of CSS classes you want to use for the various sizes. So I'm going to just use a S, M, and L for small, medium, and large. And then a block is passed into here, which passes in the tag object and a CSS class matching that. So inside of this block, I need to render out a link for the tag. So I'll use link to, and then pass in the tag name and now keep in mind that this is actually a tag model here, not a simple string. So I'm calling name on that. And also I need to link to the tag path and then pass in the tag name in there as well, because I need to use the name of the tag in the URL. And then I also need to pass in the class, which it should be the CSS class passed through here. Now, the last thing I need to do is add some CSS styling, which I'll do inside of this article CSS file. I'll just paste in the code for this, which just basically sets a different size depending on the class that is used. Let's try this out. And there I have two large links for the two tags, which are currently the only tags in existence here. So let me add some more tags so we can test this cloud out more. And there we go. I added a lot more tags and you can see they vary in size depending on how frequently they appear in the articles. And clicking on one will limit the articles to just those that appear with that tag. Now there's a lot more we can do here, such as highlighting the current tag or sorting the tags by their name, but I'll leave that up to you on how you want it displayed in your application. Now, so far we've done a lot through the axes taggable on gem, but what if I want to do this from scratch? How much work would it be? Before I can show you this, I need to roll back some of the gems functionality. So let me run rake db rollback to remove the most recent migration. And then I'll run the rails destroy command on that migration. So it removes that file. 
and then I'll remove the gem from the gem file, and then you'll need to run the bundle command to make that change. Now I can start rebuilding this functionality from scratch. I'll do this pretty fast here. First I'll generate a model called tag and just give it a name column. And then I'll generate another model called tagging and that belongs to a tag and also belongs to an article. And you might want to set up a polymorphic association here, which is actually what the gem does internally. But since we have a simple setup, I'm just going to link directly to the article model. And then I'll run the migrations to create those tables. Next, I need to set up the association. So going into the tag model, I'll just paste in the code for this, has many taggings and has many articles through taggings. Quite simple. Now the article model needs to be a little more complicated because I need to replace the functionality of this acts as taggable on. I'm just going to paste in the code for this as well. First, I set up the associations for taggings and tags through taggings. And then I just basically implement the four methods that I use on this article model elsewhere in the application. Tagged with basically just returns the articles for the tag matching that given name. And tag counts basically just uh, fetches all the tags and uh, supplies a count for them. I'd probably move this off into the tag model for this case. And then we have tag list and the getter and the setter version. And here I'm changing the behavior a little bit because I'm just returning a string for the tag list instead of ha having this uh, half array uh, type object. So this is just going to always work on strings, whether they're being set here or being uh, returned. So because this is different, I'll need to change the index template because this is treating the tag list as an array. So I'm just going to call article tags and then map the name attribute on this so it has similar behavior to the uh, the gem. But again, I'd probably move this functionality into helper because it is a little bit complicated here. Now the last thing remaining is this tag cloud helper method, and I'll just implement that in the application helper file. Uh, pasting in the code for this is pretty simple though. It just uh, takes the same arguments and fetches the uh, one, the, the tag that has a max count, and then loops through each of them and determines the class to use based off of the max count. All right, so with that, we now have roughly the same functionality, but from scratch. I can edit an article and supply some uh, tags here, and then just click update article, and there are the tags, which we can then click on one, and it will filter by that, and also the uh, tag cloud would show up appropriately too if we had more tags. So if we take a look back, the majority of the code is all in this article class. And it's really not all that much code to uh, implement this from scratch. And uh, that way you don't have an extra dependency in the gym. However, there are certainly more features that the gym provides which I didn't do from scratch, uh, such as different contexts which you can supply when uh, creating tags on a model. And also you can mark owners. So you could say a user is a tagger and that way it will keep track of that when they tag models. So in the end, it depends on what your needs are. If you just want a simple tagging solution, then implementing from scratch is a good idea. But if you want a full featured option, then use the gem. Well, that's it for this episode on adding tagging to a Rails application. Thanks for watching.